In 2020, I designed a 117-page expansion for D&D 5th Edition. It was just something for me and my friends to play, something to make the game a bit more exciting. And after years of playing, one of my friends said to me, there's enough here, it could be its own game. Flash forward to four long years later, and the summit is finally in view. What if there was more customization? What if you weren't stuck to a single class? What if you could respond what if you could when design you were spells what if you on the spot? Spot? What if there was no maximum what design spells, spells on the What if there was a game where you could play anything, be anybody, no limitations, no questions asked? I'm happy to finally say it. Welcome to Utopia. I just want to say that if you would like to follow along, grab your own character sheet, or even find a copy of the book, make sure to click the link in the description down below. It is completely free to grab. Just go ahead and download it from the website. You are all good to go. If you were to take a long look at the Utopia TTRPG character sheet before learning a single rule, it may look a bit overwhelming. In this video, I'm going to go over the main features of the game. What makes it truly unique in comparison to other mainstream games like D&D? There's a lot of features that I won't be going over, custom item design, crafting capabilities, custom spells that you can cast on the fly, all sorts of fun things to take a peek at later. I'll be focusing on the fundamentals. We'll create a character together, just to give an idea of how easy it'll be to get yourself started. After that, we'll go through a tiny simulated encounter, going through the action economy and what playing the game will look like. And once you know how to get started, I'll tell you about how you can bring it to your own table at no cost. Before diving directly into the game, I want to preface. Utopia TTRPG is a game system. It's capable of handling sci-fi settings, high fantasy settings, and just about any other setting you could imagine. The game does have its own baked-in lore, but you are not required in any capacity to use it. Regardless of whether or not you choose to use the written setting or another of your choice, the system will work all the same. I will be making the following assumptions while I explain the mechanics of this game. I'm going to assume that you know, at least roughly, what a tabletop role-playing game is. Just in case, here's the spark notes. Every campaign will have a game master, somebody who narrates the story and controls the outcome of the player's interactions. TTRPGs include lots of dice, and we refer to them as quantity, d, size, fashion. For instance, 4d6 is me saying four six-sided dice. I'm going to be talking about a lot of numbers and new vocabulary, and it may seem somewhat daunting at first, but I can promise you that once all of the pieces lock together, it'll become second nature. Everybody I've taught this game to no longer needed my help making a character after two to three plays of the game. Now, with that out of the way, let's create a character. When it comes to creating a character, the first decision you'll have to make is what species you want to play. In the core guide of Utopia, there are seven playable species, some broken into more subspecies, leaving us with 15 total options. A species will give you a series of stat bonuses while also giving you access to a unique set of talents that you'll unlock throughout the game. Some species even have unique innate abilities right off the bat, ranging from having two usable heads to being able to fly. For our character, we'll be choosing one of the more basic options a copper dwarf. Both types of dwarves are pretty solid all-arounders with some basic combat abilities and a nice spread of bonuses. We'll get more into what makes these specific characters unique as well as some others later in the video. For now, we have a number of stats that we need to jot down. Every species will have a handful of stats built into them. Dwarves have the following. 3d4 block rating and 1d12 dodge rating. These symbolize a set of dice you'll roll whenever you're trying to deflect an oncoming attack. 4 Constitution, 6 Endurance, and 3 Effervescence. These metrics will determine how your health points and stamina points will scale with each level. These are not very easy to change during the game, but it's more than possible. One thing we can't forget, we'll need to set each of our defenses to 1. This is true for all characters in general. These will be going up soon though, don't worry. Finally, Copper Doors are gifted in Memory, Resolve, and Engineering. This means that our character will be able to gain points in these skills much easier. Perfect! We have some of our basic metrics scribed in, and now come some of the big decisions. Let's pick some talents. The way that you gain new abilities in Utopia TTRPG is through talents. Each talent costs a number of talent points, and you'll get another one every time you level up. In Utopia, we start at level 10. This is a fresh, brand new character. This will give us a nice pool of points to pick from right off the bat. Starting any lower than this would make the character somewhat difficult to play or make sense of. 
All characters should have access to seven total talent trees. One of them is called a species talent tree. These are the aforementioned talents that are specific to the species you choose when you create your character. We chose a copper dwarf, so we'll have access to these talents. All talent trees function the same way. You are able to take the first tier ability in any branch of a talent tree. This is a branch and this is a tier. So for instance, if we were looking to take stubborn, we'll have to acquire the or scent talent first. Knowing that, let's take both of these talents. Now, as previously mentioned, all talents come at a cost. At the bottom of each talent are three numbers. Respectively, these are body, mind, and soul cost. When we're acquiring a talent, we'll just add these numbers together. Or scent, which we'll have to take first, costs zero body, one mind, and zero soul. So it will cost a total of one talent point. Stubborn costs zero body and zero mind, but one soul. It'll also cost one talent point. If we turn back to our character sheet, here's what'll change. We spent two talent points, so we'll go from 10 down to eight. Looking back at the talents, they cost a total of one mind and one soul point. So each of those respective scores will go up to one. And that's how every single talent tree works. With that information, let's grab some more talents. I'm going to refer to some more combat focused talents, specifically those of the warfare and the tactics core trees. These are trees that all characters can access, and these two specifically are for combat and evasion. With eight points left, I'll be taking the sprint talent for one body point, allowing us to expend stamina to move faster in a pinch. The cleave talent for one body and one soul, allowing us to target a second enemy when we deal excess damage. Swift strike for a single body point allows us to attack faster with slow weapons. And finally, brawler for three body and one soul to give us a higher chance of successfully grappling. We've now spent all 10 of our talent points, leaving us with six body, one mind, and three soul. Immediately, you'll probably be able to see what kind of character we're building. This will affect the next step, so the number of body, mind, and soul points you acquire should be something to keep in mind. Now that we have our talent squared away, let's pick out some stats. I'm going to refer to this section of stats a lot, so let's put some names on each one. These six large stats, starting with agility and ending with charm, are called traits. The 12 smaller ones are called sub-traits, and this is what we'll be working with to start off with. Each of these sub-traits will start at 1, keeping in mind that as a Copper Dwarf we are gifted in Engineering, Memory, and Resolve. If your character ever has to commit a difficult or daring action, your Game Master may ask you to make a test. When you make a test, you refer to how good you are at the given task by checking a respective sub-trait. For instance, if you are trying to keep your balance on a rocking ship, I may ask you to make a stunt test, whereas if you are trying to inspect a machine for potential damage, I'd have you make an engineering test. At level 10, we have 15 total points to spend to increase our subtraits. You can add these points to your subtraits in any way that you wish, but with one big limitation. These top four subtraits are body traits. They cannot go any higher than your body score. For us, that's six. The next four are your mind traits. For us, they're capped at just one, with one exception. Since we're gifted in engineering, memory, and resolve, we can bring those sub-traits up to double what they would normally be. This means that we can actually increase them to two instead of one. The final four soul sub-traits are maxed out at three for us due to our soul score. Since we're building a somewhat combat-focused character, let's push our power up a couple of points. We'll spend five points bringing it up to a maximum of six. Speed is a relatively important factor in combat, so we'll put three points into that, making it four. Since they're pretty important in general, let's put a point into Engineering, Memory, and Resolve, spending three total points to put each of them to two. Unfortunately, since we're not gifted in Awareness, we can't bring it any higher than one, since our mind score is only one. With four remaining points, let's put two points into Portrayal for when we want to act intimidating, and two points into Stunts so we can handle difficult terrain better. Perfect! We have all of our subtraits written out, and now we can calculate our traits. Each trait is attached to two subtraits. Simply, it will be the sum of those two. Our agility score is equal to speed plus dexterity, meaning we'll have an agility of 5. Going down the line, we can scribe in each of our trait scores and finally calculate our modifiers, which will go into these boxes. For both subtraits and traits, the modifiers equal to the score minus four. This will be negative sometimes. For instance, since we have an awareness score of one, our awareness modifier will be negative three. But since we have a strength score of seven, we'll have a strength mod of plus three. A very important note, a score and a modifier are very different. Our strength score is seven, whereas our strength modifier is plus three. Our modifier is what we'll use when we're making a test. We'll add our modifier to the value of the roll to get the final outcome. 
More on that later. And of course, one more very important change to make. Subtraits that we're gifted in can't be negative. This means that our engineering, resolve, and memory modifiers will be bumped up to a plus zero instead of their normal negative two. And there's only one more choice we have to make before our character is fully fleshed out. Every 10 levels, we'll get what's called a specialist talent. Specialist talents are adjacent to feats in other games, essentially a list of different abilities that you can pick from. Some have prerequisites while others don't. Since we're starting at level 10, we get to pick one right off the bat. There are many dozens of specialist talents to look through and I highly advise taking a look through them while you're designing a character for yourself. For now, I'm gonna go ahead and grab this one. Pragmatic. It increases our engineering score by 1, putting us from 2 to 3, and gives us a point of favor on tests made to tamper with devices. I do want to say that this does push our engineering score beyond its maximum, and specialist talents can do that, so keep that in mind. Once we're duking it out, we'll dive into what a point of favor does for us. We still have some boxes empty in our character sheet. Now that we have all of our talents and subtraits picked out, we'll finally be able to fill these in. At level 10, our XP will start out at 0 out of 1000. Whenever we level up, we'll be reset back to 0 XP and excess will carry over. The amount of XP you need to level up will always be equal to your total level times 100. If this doesn't make sense yet, we will go over it again once we get into our encounter. We have these three other stats with funny names, SHP, DHP, and Stamina. SHP and DHP are both types of health points that our character has, though they serve different purposes. SHP stands for surface health points, and it's the amount of surface level harm that our character can withstand. DHP on the other hand stands for deep health points, and it's wounding on a level with internal bleeding, organ damage, things of that nature. When we rest, we'll regain all of our SHP, but our DHP will require medical attention to restore. Damage that our character takes will always hit SHP first, at least until it's reduced to zero, in which we'll start losing DHP. Stamina, on the other hand, is simply an energy resource that our character can use for certain abilities. For instance, the sprint talent requires that we spend 3 stamina to increase our speed while we're running. We can regain up to 6 stamina each turn, or about 1 stamina a second. There's a formula for each of these stats. Our maximum SHP is equal to our body score times our constitution plus our level. In our case, this is 6 times 4 plus 10, leaving us with 34 SHP. Our stamina will be mind times endurance plus level, leaving us with only 16. Our DHP will be soul times effervescence plus level, giving us a hearty 19 DHP. These calculations are in the book, and for new players, I'd personally recommend writing it down on your character sheet. This system makes it so that taking certain talents will affect your character's total health pool and stamina pool, further modified by what species you're playing. Other than gathering items and spending money, our actual character is fully completed. We'll do the items in our first scenario. Let's set the scene. Our young dwarven adventurers finally making their way home from a long trek, a search for a handful of violet lotuses. The local tailor requested it for a new project upcoming. It was ultimately a quiet journey leading up to this point, but the sun is falling behind the canopy of trees above, and a chill is creeping its way up your spine. You begin to count the distance in your head. It shouldn't be more than 10 minutes before you're home, but you're interrupted. A small creature bursts out of the bushes, snarling and crying at you. It wields a small pointed ship, and it seems like it plans to thrust it at you. Before anything happens, you scour for something that could give you an edge. Unfortunately, there wasn't much, but a large stick should at least do better than your bare hands. Alright, so you've entered a tussle with a goblin. Many experienced players have been here many times before. For this stick we picked up, I'll be using the bludgeon stat block. A bludgeon is one of the few improvised weapon blocks, so it's pretty much designed for this scenario. When we enter combat, I'll have you make a speed test to decide on turn order. The higher you roll, the higher chance you go first. All tests are rolled with 3d6. This is much different from the standard 1d20 system that many modern games use. 3d6 has a minimum roll of 3 and a maximum roll of 18, and will hit middle numbers around 10 to 11 much more often. With that in mind, you rolled a 13. As with any test, you'll take a look at your speed modifier. In our case, that is a plus zero, so we won't be adding anything to the roll. Luckily, you rolled higher than the goblin, so you will be going first. Here's what you'll need to know. On each of your turns, you'll have six turn actions that you can spend before your turn is over. You don't have to use all of them, but it's often beneficial to do so. Each turn action is roughly one second of time, meaning your turn takes about six seconds. 
a couple of important actions that we'll need to take note of. You can take the travel action with a single turn action. Upon doing so, you'll move a number of spaces, each space being one meter, equal to your speed score. For us, that's four meters per turn action. Since there's a decent gap between us and the goblin, let's spend two turn actions to move in for an attack. Perfect. We're in striking distance and still have four turn actions left. A bludgeon requires two turn actions to attack with and deals 2d8 damage, so we'll be able to swing with it twice. If you play D&D, this will be a new thing for you. We don't roll to hit. We just simply hit and roll for damage. So let's roll our 2d8. Looks like we rolled a 7, but there's a catch. Defending creatures have a chance to block or dodge up to twice per turn. This allows them to roll their block rating or their dodge rating in order to attempt to avoid the damage. Each of these work differently, but we'll get more into that on your turn. With a mix of the goblins blocking you and its defenses, it was able to prevent four total damage of your attack, only taking three. Luckily, these guys are pretty weak, so it's still better than nothing. For our second attack, we rolled a 12, which is much better. It attempted to block you, preventing a total of five damage, leaving us with only seven damage getting through. Remember when I said goblins are weak? Well, this creature is now mortally wounded. Mortally wounded is a way for a game master to tell you that the creature has zero SHP left. Different creatures have different amounts of SHP versus DHP, so it can vary what this means. However, you can usually be pretty confident that it means that you've carved through at least half of its health. We've used all six of our turn actions, so it's the goblin's turn now. On each other creature's turn, you'll have two interrupt actions. An interrupt action can be spent to react to something happening. These are what we'll use to block or dodge incoming attacks. Speaking of that, the goblin is coming in for an attack. We'll start by dodging, spending one of our two interrupt actions. In order to dodge, we'll roll our dodge rating, which for our dwarven adventure is 1d12. If we successfully roll an amount equal to or higher than the amount of damage we would have taken, we prevent all of the damage. Otherwise, we take all of the damage. Oh no, it looks like we rolled a 1. The goblin is coming in with 7 damage. We do have one physical defense, so it'll go down to six, but that's still much higher than one, so we'll be taking the full six damage, dropping us to 28 health. It's attacking again. Its weapon is awful fast. It's probably safe to assume that it's using a one turn action weapon, meaning that it can attack up to six times per turn. To balance, these weapons generally deal substantially less damage. For its second attack, we'll block, rolling our block rating of 3d4. When we block an attack, we simply ignore an amount of damage equal to what we rolled. The goblin rolled only a 3, and we rolled a 7 with our block. You throw your stick up in a way of the goblin's small shiv, preventing it from making any contact with you at all. The goblin is coming in for its third attack, and now we face an issue. We're out of interrupt actions. For the rest of the goblin's turn, we won't be able to respond at all. The goblin rolled a 3, minus our 1 physical defense, we'll be taking another 2 physical damage. Rather than preparing for another attack, the injured goblin dashes off into the brush, attempting to hide from you. Knowing goblins, it's unlikely that the goblin would truly flee. You've tussled with a handful of them in the past, especially when you'd go hunting with the butcher in town. Chances are it's going to attempt to ambush you. Since you're unaware of what the goblin is doing, I can't tell you how it spends the rest of its turn actions or how many it has used to move. With that in mind, it's now your turn. You'll need to figure out where the goblin is hiding, so let's make an awareness test. That'll be 3d6 plus your awareness modifier. You rolled a 16. That's a really good roll. However, we have an awareness modifier of negative 3, meaning that we actually only rolled a 13. Luckily, the goblin is being awfully loud. You spot it in the bush just to your west flank, slowly making its way towards you, preparing to lunge. Since you're ready, you'll be able to respond just fine. It spends both of its interrupt actions to move in towards you, but you are more than prepared. One of the talents we took, specifically the brawler talent, said that we gain a point of favor on test made to grapple other creatures. Let's put that to use. In order to grapple a creature, we'll make a strength test against it. Because of brawler, we'll gain a point of favor. For each point of favor, we'll get an additional d6 to add to our roll, meaning we'll be rolling 4d6. For reference, disfavor does the opposite of this, removing a die from our roll. We rolled a 14, and we have a plus 3 to strength, meaning we rolled a 17. More than enough to pin this goblin down. Grappling requires 3 turn actions, so we should have 3 remaining. We can get 1 good hit in with 2 turn actions, so let's give it a good smack. You rolled a 16 on 2d8, maximum damage. You hold this goblin pinned to the ground, raising your makeshift club. The goblin raises its bloodied hands up in an attempt to brace itself, but it's no use. A loud thud echoes through the brush and the goblin's eyes lay frozen open. 
Taking a second to regain yourself, you process everything that happened before collecting your items, including your violet lotuses, and make your way back to town. You can't help but be a bit excited to tell your triumphant story to the tailor tonight before bed. Congratulations on your first successful encounter. This was of course a very basic encounter, but it should offer some good reference as to how the game is played. More importantly though, you earned 1200 XP from this encounter. Since your maximum XP is currently 1000, you leveled up. The remaining 200 XP will carry over, leaving you with 200 XP out of 1100. Let's go over what happens when you level up. First of all, your maximum SHP, DHP, and stamina will each increase by one. If you're ever lost about what maximum stat should be, you can always refer back to the calculations we talked about before. You'll gain one talent point. These are the same points we used to acquire new talents before. You'll gain another one every level and you can take a new talent at any time, given you have enough talent points to acquire it. Finally, we'll get to boost one of our sub traits by one every level. We still have to observe each of our maximums. This means that our engineering, resolve, and memory, and awareness can't be increased at all. With that in mind, let's put a point into dexterity, pushing it to two, making our agility score six. Now you'll be a bit more prepared for your next adventure. This project really has been a part of me for the last four years now. What was once a pipe dream is suddenly so close to being something so real, and honestly, I'm a little dumbfounded. If you want to learn more about this game, or even play it for yourself, you can grab a manuscript in the description below. I do mean a fully playable manuscript, one that you can print out right now and begin playing. However, it's not published, and it's not fully complete yet. It's missing official illustrations, publishing, bindings, and all the good stuff that comes with a real TTRPG. I'll be asking for your support in making this happen. Upon release of this video, I'll have a Kickstarter up for only 30 days with a $5,000 goal. This will be enough to cover professional editing, setting up distribution, ordering the starting inventory of hardback copies, and paying for its full illustration. This campaign will allow you to pre-order a copy for yourself as well as get your name in the final copy. I'm so happy to see you here at the end of this video and I would really love for you to take a look. Even if you can't support it financially, please consider sharing this with a friend that may be interested. If you have questions for me directly, I'm very active in the Discord in the description below and love answering any questions you may have about Utopia. And of course, thanks.